Well, I said in previous videos that I was going to mention my own Indigenous past, but in a way, um, I'm going to start this by saying that anyone that's actually born in Australia is Indigenous. You don't, I mean, uh, any person that has come as an immigrant to Australia and their children are born in Australia, they are Indigenous to Australia. So to say that you are an Indigenous Australian is basically just saying, I was born in Australia. But generally, people apply the word Indigenous to imply an, in, an historical Indigenous tribal connection to the land over a period of time in history, or the Aboriginal culture and heritage in Australia. And why I distinguish Aboriginal culture in Australia is because Aboriginal is also a generic term, meaning, um, as I've explained in previous uh, version, uh, videos, that Aboriginal means the originals of God's creation. So that's actually saying you are Aboriginal is actually stating more that you have got a long tie to the land than if you are just Indigenous because anyone born in Australia is Indigenous to Australia. Anyone born in America is Indigenous to America. And if me being Indigenous to Australia flew to America and had my family over there, my kids would be indigenous to America. So being indigenous only just says that you are born in that country. It does not establish the cultural ties like Aboriginal does in the term that it is establishing an historical tie to the original tribes and the creation in that area. Abba's original. Abba being the term that was applied, um, meaning God, God and creation and all that. So when the term Aboriginal is applied, it is also applied to um, people that, you know, we call Eskimos and all these different areas. They're Aboriginal too because they have got the cultural, historical connection generationally linked through that land. So to claim that you are Indigenous just means I was born here. It, it means nothing more. To state you are Aboriginal Australian actually states that you have a long heritage and cultural connection through the generations to the land. Yeah, And now I've said that, um, that is just my interpretation of the difference between Indigenous and Aboriginal. I mean, there are a lot of activists out there that are going, oh, that's a, it's an insult term to be called an Aboriginal. Actually, no, it's not. It is a badge of honour classifying you as the traditional custodians of the land. And, you know, I even take offence to all these ones calling themselves TOs, traditional owners. It is a term that they actually apply because most of society, general society, understands that to claim ownership over something means that, you know, that belongs to us. But in the mindset of Aboriginals, they've never been owners, only ever custodians. They have worked in sync with the land, in harmony with the land. Uh, I mean, it is their home. It is their reason for survival. If they do not work with the land, they're dead. You know, like imagine if you're in the middle of the desert and you believe that, oh, look, I'm in a lush tropical rainforest with food hanging from the vines everywhere and fresh water running everywhere. And, you know, it's very easy, easier living. No, you have to work with the land. You have to understand the land. You have to be part of it if you want to survive in it. So that said, 
I'm Indigenous Australian, as is anyone born in Australia. But what I'm going to discuss here is not the Indigenous aspect of my birth here in Australia, but what perhaps is my Aboriginal connection uh, through my family history and a few... Well, when Mum told me when I was a kid, you know, you have to understand generations were different then. Speaking about certain things just wasn't on. And so when Mum told me about my father and his mother, it was one of those things that's hush hush, it's a family secret, you know. Because, you know, if you didn't fit within those normal, acceptable standards, you were shunned in society. I mean, my father was born in a chapel for unwed mothers because it was such a shame back then. You know, and I mean, even when mum back years ago, I'm not going to repeat things of her secrets because they are her secrets, but even things that are by standards today uh, acceptable and easily accessible to women, even back then they were, um, well, I suppose you could kind of look at it as shunned upon a sin in society because there's still a lot of Christian values and morals that people are upholding. Mum was a Sunday school teacher. She dragged us to church every Sunday. And after we'd fis finished listening to the sermon from this guy that was sitting up there, you know, as a kid I hadn't even done anything and he's telling me I'm a worthless sinner and I'm going to hell. And I'm thinking, well, hey, no matter what I do, I'm going to hell. You know what? He says that God's all forgiving and loving and yet he says that we're all going to hell. I don't understand that. That's just such a contradiction. So even at a young age, you know, having religion thrust into my face, it never made sense. It was a contradiction of terms because, you know, how could it be both things? You know, God's going to punish your every crime, yet he's all forgiving and forgives everything. You know, no matter what you do, no matter what you do right, you're going to hell. You have to be, a, you know, virtually appointed a saint on this planet that that's your only way into heaven. And I didn't accept that. I just didn't accept this really narrow and contradictory version of life. You know, and as a kid, when they're telling you these are the rules, it's like, no, nah, I don't agree with your rules. I think you've got them all wrong just because you're a grown-up. And the thing was that as a kid, I was experiencing things that other, well, a lot of other people didn't experience. And so when you go to them and ask them about it, well... There's no framework for them to tell you that, well, you're just making it up. It's like, no, I'm not making this stuff up. I want to know what, what's going on with me. Can you tell me? Well, it's not real. No, 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 no. Telling me it's not real is not going to stop it, okay? It's not solving my problem telling me it's not real because even though you're not experiencing it, it's real for me. And I don't know why you're not experiencing it. So as a kid... I suffered a lot of frustration and after a while I soon learnt, guess what, grown-ups don't know everything and certainly the perspective that they were showing me wasn't the life, the reality I was experiencing. Yes, 99% of my life was like everybody else's but there was 1% of it that only I experienced, nobody else did. And when it first started happening to me, I thought it was just a natural thing that happened to everybody. And so you just naturally ask questions. And then when you don't get answers to them, you're told that it doesn't exist and these things keep happening, it's like, well, it's not getting me anywhere. Your opinion of what is real is not changing what is real for me. And they're set about a lifelong quest. To find out what was real. By the time I'd got to my teenage years, I'd finished um, high school matric, which is 11 and 12 on the mainland, and I started reading what I wanted to read. And some of the first things I read were some of the great classics. And one of them that I read was Plato's The Republic. And 
it was really interesting because when you read something like that, it takes you back to the mindset of the person that was writing it. In a time when they wrote it, what they thought and how they perceived the world. And in his The Republic, it, it's quite a um, lengthy read, but I got right into trying to understand the mindset of the people in history, what they were thinking and where they were coming from. And in reading The Republic, it was all about their political systems, the government systems. And by Plato's time, he had identified all the key ways to govern human beings. And he analysed all of those different ways where you govern human beings under different systems. And then he explained how each and every single one of them is a natural progression into the next one, into the next one, into the next one. And that they will all continue to cycle around through... Um, different stages of governance but ultimately it all falls within um, a natural progression that if one develops it will develop into either or of these things and when you have a even a dictator or a monarch they can be a benevolent one or a malevolent one all of these conditions that we find that change each time the, the ruling head changes and everything becomes from their perspective. So you have one ruler that rules over a large population with a dip different interpretation and way that they want to enforce things. But no matter where you go, as a human being, you are always going to find that there are basic rules and laws and allowances for the fact that you do not exist on this planet as a sole human being in isolation to everything else that you are part of something so establishing who you are and what you are a part of first you need to find out who you are and it's taken me many decades because, you know, like so many of the tribal cultures that claim that, you know, you're lost and you don't know what's going on, you're no different than anybody else that is struggling to find their place in this world and to find meaning. But you are not going to find your place in this world until you find your place, until you know who you are, until you can accept that you are a flawed human being and I know that to some people I may appear arrogant because I have got to a position where I have learnt certain things and I will not go backwards if you want to add to the information that I have all well and been but I'm not going to go backwards you know it for some you know I, I know this sounds mentally arrogant but there is so much that people say to me that is going backwards for me I've been there done that I do not need to go through that all again I have my sense of self I understand my connection to this planet to the people around me and outside of the planet in the grand scheme of the whole universe where we look at all our little fights inside this planet, but you know, our planet is just a speck in the cosmos. We are just one of many players in the cosmos. And other players in the cosmos have come and played in our planet, you know. Some didn't leave. Some are still here, some walk amongst you, you don't even know it. And many in the earth carry the genetics, the DNA of the descendants of those that walked amongst us, still do. It's been a long history in the planet that we will never ever know what has gone on. We can only come to the conclusions 
with our own proofs and understandings, which is what I've done. Now, when I share anything that I say, I want people to understand that these are my proofs. I share my perspective so that others may understand, well, not necessarily me, because I'm not asking people to understand me. I'm saying use my experience if it will help you to understand something of your own. That's the only reason I share what I share, is that if anything I say or do can help others to understand their own life and find some connection and meaning. Because through the journey that each of us make, we will all have our own unique journey. And what works for me isn't going to work for so many others and vice versa. I mean, I have heard so many people's journeys of how they've got enlightenment and all of this, and none of that crap worked for me. Well, for the word go, I had different experiences that showed me that certain things were real. I didn't have to go out looking for proof. It came to me. It was part of my experience. So right from the outset, I wasn't going out looking for proof that these things were real. I was looking for understanding of why they were real and why they existed. How could they exist? How could, you know, as a kid, you ask yourself these questions. How could the world exist in ways that the grown-ups have no clue of? How is it that what I'm experiencing, they're not? And then you start to wonder, and as you get older and you look at what's reported out in books and everything like that, you see that, well, nobody's saying they're having these kinds of experiences. But then in about, the, well, I suppose more the end of the 80s, the New Age era started to open up and a lot more people started coming out with their own unique experiences. And it was through hearing others' unique experiences that I began to understand my own. And it wasn't that I found them in a book, you know, that people were selling because they made money out of it. These were people that were just saying, look, I went through this, you know, it happened. I don't know why or how it happened. I'm just trying to understand the reality of it in my life. I'm not asking others to believe me. So, you know, this whole world of information opened up and I was able to go through and, well, I suppose, find lots of validations for myself in hearing other people's experience and you know, like there was so much about what they talked about that no, I didn't go through quite that thing, but there were so many things that they spoke about that was similar and it gave me something to think about. And every time I thought about it and I did, you know, in a reflection as you want to call it, thinking and contemplating it, you get to a stage where you think, well, I don't know. And then one day, you, just randomly, this thought pops into your head and suddenly that thing that you didn't know there's that bit of information now that makes you understand and you can see things that they you do understand it so it's not a matter that I need people to explain to me their perspective because I've I've seen so many different perspectives and from my perspective I don't like a lot of those perspectives. I try not to say that they're wrong. I'm just discerning and making a judgment that that's not the perspective I want to hold. This is the one I want to hold. This is the truth I want to walk. And when I say truth, truth is something for me that is constantly evolving because I could go out tomorrow and some other thing will happen in my life that will add to the truth that I understand. So it is, truth is not an absolute thing. It is completely from a personal perspective. And for many years, 
I didn't understand why, well, I don't fit into many places, never have. You know, and for a lot of years, I struggled with that. You know, I w would be lying if I said I didn't. That to not feel like you fit in anywhere, that there's no one that you can talk to that will understand what you have been through and all the different things that you wanted answers for or that you experienced in your life that most people can't give you an answer because they don't even think it's real. So you are forced to find your own truth and try to keep your sanity in the world as well and that's why I do have a bit of a laugh you know you've got to laugh things off and I have to thank my kids for that they made me realize that you know what well, you can get all cranky about things but that just makes things worse now I'm focusing I'm going to get back to I said that I would talk about my indigenous heritage and as I explained earlier that indigenous just means I was born in Australia I was born in Tasmania but after saying that I'm also going to now talk about what is my Aboriginal heritage now being born and bred in Tasmania I can tell you that when I left decades ago there were no, well, nobody knew of any Tasmanian Aboriginals. There was a lot of talk on the mainland about Aboriginal groups, but it was believed that all Tasmanian Aboriginals had been wiped out. And that was just a general belief in society, whether it was actually the case or not. Um, well, clearly there are descendants. and. Well, I'd have to say, yeah, there are descendants. There's, um, all right, let's get back to my dad and his mother. Now, I know who my dad's mum is. She gave birth to my dad in a chapel for wayside mothers. <laughs> That's what they call a wayside chapel for unwed ma mothers, sorry. And Dad's father's name was never put down on a, the birth certificate. Nana married, and the man she married is also part of this story. And, well, I, he's not my dad's real dad, but he is his brother's and sister's real dad. That's the way the story has always gone, but it's not even anything that was... It was, I only knew that because mum had told me. And it was, as I said, like the family secret. You don't go talking about this. So my dad's dad, my nana went to the grave never telling anybody who he was. But the thing about my dad too, you know, like you're born and bred in Tasmania, you know that people are really white. You, know, you you need sunglasses <laughs> to block your glare off the white skin because it, it's generally cold. You, you have your clothes on a lot. There's not many tanned people. And if you do tan a little bit, you know, it doesn't last for very long before you have to rug up over winter and you turn blindingly white again. Well, you see, my dad was always mm, very tanned, I suppose you could say. <laughs> always tanned and very, well, jet black hair. And, you know, there was never any perception back then that Dad was actually half-caste Aboriginal, n none whatsoever. Even Nana that she was half-caste Aboriginal because, as I say, it was everything in society was done by prim and proper and only by what Mum telling me that I even know any of this. You know, it's the family secret. You, and here I am blabbing it out on public media, mate. Eh? That's good. Getting my dirty laundry out. But it's not dirty laundry. It's trying to find your connections because my Nana died with a secret that, you know, has denied the generations of knowing which tribe did we come from, Nana. Come on. The most I can tell you is what I believe has gone on. 
for a lot of years, I just, well, the family that Nana married into and Nana have always had a strong connection to Bruny Island. There was some connection to Truganini. I don't know what that connection was. And over the years, I realised that, well, Nana's, you know, like if you've ever watched Roots and seen how um, some of the slaves from generation to generation, the plantation owner would have sexual relationships with the slaves and half-castes would be born. Now, I'm using the Roots example so because in my head this is how I understood that over a couple of generations my nana could have my dad because my dad and my nana are, were, because they're both past now, um, Aboriginal. And when I asked dad years later because um, mum and dad split up when I was about 10 and had very little to do with him over the years. But when I did catch up with him, I asked him because I wanted to know where that connection was in the Aboriginal line in Tasmania with us. I mean, we all know it's there, but Nana never told anybody anything. So ultimately... The thing is that uh, recently I did look up because a lot more has come out about the Tasmanian Aboriginals and I looked it up and there was the guy, the, you know, the plantation owner, so to speak, and his very last name was the one my dad was given when he married, when she married into that family because... Yeah, well, and the thing being too about my nana and my pop was that they were both in the army together and there was something that went on to do with the military too associated with them. I don't know what. Now, you could never ask nana and pop anything because nana and pop uh, were alcoholics. My dad was an alcoholic. His brother and his sister were all alcoholics. They were all alcoholics. There was a lot that they struggled with. And over the years, I didn't understand a lot of that. I didn't even understand my nana until I actually, more well, five years ago, when I was in northern New South Wales and I met other half-castes that had lost that connection. And they were, I mean, they were just, that was my nana, you know, and I understood then just like nana, oh yeah, my nana was connected to Bruni Island, also was the man that she married and I believe the father of dad, my dad, and I don't th well, I don't think the man that my nana married, my pop, is actually my dad's dad. Uh, you, but he is actually someone that was descendant from the ones that were the landowners. Like, the thing, sad thing about my pop, he came from a very wealthy family and his generation pissed it up at the wall at the pub. They blew the whole lot of it. And this is a story of so many fortunes that were made that the next generation pisses it up the wall. You know, nothing left. Now, the family, the well-to-do family, a lot of the stone that was cut out of round Triabunna, up Swansea and that area that was shipped over to Melbourne is actually, you know, those old buildings that you see standing in uh, Melbourne area, all the old churches and uh, buildings. A lot of that quarried rock came from my grandfather's family. 
So they had lots of money, they were well to do, but yeah, as I said, my pop's generation pissed it up the wall. When I met him, well, when I remember meeting him, they were in a housing commission place out at Chigwell. And Chigwell's one of the, well, it's not one of the better areas in Hobart. We would go around and visit my nana and pop. Even after dad left, mum would take us around there all the time, you know, on a Sunday and have the Sunday dinner. And then one day I got to the stage where I said to mum, why, why do you take us round there? Dad's not even there. And they're always drunk. And, you know, like, as soon as you'd walk in the door, Pop would come over and he'd have these luber lips, you know, all out. And he'd give you this really big sloppy kiss and slobber it all down your face and he'd stink of beer. I mean, he never did stink of anything other than beer. And Nana, well, <laughs> she loved her sherry. <laughs> she stunk of that. And she'd get quite fired up and nasty at times, Nana too, and she'd have an argument with Pop, and it was like, well, you know, Pop doesn't do anything. You know, he just sits there and <laughs> drinks and drinks. Sometimes he'll say something, and then Nana would have a go at him, and it was completely different to, like, going and visiting my Nana and Pop, you know, Mum's parents. Like, they never spoke to each other like that. They were never drunk and, yeah, yelling at each other. It was chalk and cheese. And as a kid, I didn't like going round to my dad's parents' place. They're just a bunch of arguing drunks. And, you know, it's not good to speak ill of the dead, but up until the day they died, they were all drunks. And my dad hadn't learned anything. And my dad, even when I did contact him years later, I mean, he was in his early 60s and he tried to find out what his Aboriginal heritage was but he could not find out anything and maybe more's come out over the years but ultimately the best kept secrets will not be written down it's something that we will never know because well let's face it my dad was born out of wedlock to someone that it would have shamed the family if it, the father's name had been put down. So, and that's why a lot of the birth records are not going to put it down. And another interesting thing too is that, yeah, mum used to tell me lots of gossip around the relatives and it's not just on my dad's side, it's on my mum's side as well. Because all my mum's relatives um, come from up around this area up here, St Helens, Winnelier, Derby, Nabola, Scottsdale, they've all spread out now. But they come from up there. And the story on my grand grandfather's side, on, on my mum's side, her grandfather was supposedly not even the son of the the, the the grandfather before that he took on the... No, he was the son, but his mother wasn't the mother. And that's confusing, isn't it? So, in other words, let's just say the dad had an affair, got a woman pregnant, she had the child, and the child was then given to the dad to raise as his own, as his own son in that family. That's where... My mum's father came through that line of a man that was, well, half adopted by the mother who then took the child into the family and raised that son as her own. When I was told that, I thought, wow, you know, because that apparently happened a, a bit, that if a woman got pregnant to another man, it was hush-hushed and the baby was given to the man to raise as his own. The wife accepted it, the child as their child and raised that child as their own. But we all know in scenarios like that that the child is going to have a hard time being treated equally because, well, hey, shit, what woman isn't going to resent the fact that her husband went and screwed someone else and got them pregnant and now what, I've got to raise their baby too and pretend like it's mine? Wow. But they did that kind of shit, eh? 
Yeah, this is a true story. <laughs> so my grandfather on my mum's side, Abel, was the the man's son, but not the mother's son. He was actually given over at birth to go and live with the father and be raised within that family. And the thing being that never found out who his mother was because you don't talk about that. That will shame the family. Just nobody talks about that. Well, if it wasn't for the fact that mum would tell me these things because, you know, every holidays when we go up and visit, visit the relatives up around these areas, all the old ones would come in together and yak with mum and they'd all gossip. I mean, <laughs> mum loved it. You know, she'd find out all this stuff, you know. I didn't like it at all because all they did was talk about each other. And half the time it wasn't very nice, you know. I was like, oh, did you hear what so-and-so was up to? <gasps> and they all, you know, and like some of the things I heard them say, it was like, well, that's not very nice. I wonder if you talk about me like that behind your back, <laughs> behind my back. And it's like, yeah, people talking behind your backs. So the thing that I've lived my life with, is that I will say something, but if I've said it and you're not present, that I don't consider that saying it behind your back because I'd say it to your face too. And I've actually even apologised to people that didn't even know that I said something behind their back. And I said I was, you know, I said something that you didn't know, I was wrong, and so I corrected the person. They said, well, I didn't even know you'd said that. And I said, well, it doesn't matter, I'd said it and just letting you know that... Yeah, I'd said it, I was wrong, and I told the person I was wrong. So a lot of gossip ends up being, you know, lots of different stories and opinions. But it's also in these old gossip stories. Like when mum was, you know, young, and the older generation was still connected with, no they were still alive, they knew. You know, and this is where they'd be telling the stories to mum, you know, in the gossip sessions. Oh, did you know? Did you know that Abel's real, you know, mother is so-and-so? That he had an affair with her and, you know, oh, it would have, it caused a bit of a stir at the time, but they hushed it all up and, you know. You, the, you, these things actually went on. And my dad's family was well to do. They had a lot of money. They had power and position, I suppose you would call it. Like so many other different families did have at the time, and not just in Tasmania. My ex-husband's family did exactly the same thing. Generations past that had built up and got a position, wealth and name, the generations after pissed it up at the pub, lost a whole lot divided off the land and every generation it seems that these heritages get smaller and smaller and smaller but that's another issue that's actually about um, losing heritage and it's not just from a tribal perspective you know that like I look at the heritage that's been lost in this area up here where my family my larger family, I suppose you could call it my tribe, where there is no connection and there is, I mean, I'm related to so many people. Years ago, they rented out a um, hall in St. Helens and a few people showed up that were relatives. The hall was filled and you wouldn't have even said 1% of the people that were related to each other in Tasmania actually showed up of that one family. Because through the generations, as people disperse out, they marry someone else, they change their name. The next generation, they do exactly the same thing. And then uh, as you realise that, you realise that on the broader scale, that we are all related to each other. But it's actually finding that connection of where we actually belong. I, I've got this whole family that I don't even really belong to because I don't think the same as them and I've never acted the same way as them. A lot of these people are good B 
basic tribal far, uh, tribal farming people. Uh, they used to be Christian, but now they're just your basic down-to-earth people on the land. But even that has dwindled, you know, from what I was, what I saw when I was a kid, how the family farms would be vast and there would be vast resources that would help the larger relatives. Like, you know, in certain areas that pretty much you could say the whole town has built up around the landowners in the family and providing for each other. You know, it, it's a community support system that has just naturally come from families as they extend out and become bigger and bigger. But in the modern day, we've created this disconnectedness from all those ties. And white culture feels this more readily than what tribal cultures do. I mean, at least you have some real heritage and connection to go back to. What does a white man have? He's got a church that preaches that you're going to go to hell unless you live the life of a saint. It gives you riddles and cryptics and tells you stories to control you. It doesn't tell you the truth. Well, it tells you some truths, half truths. But it's designed to control you into behaving yourself into in society. Religions are a control mechanism. I'm not religious. I'm not bound by any faith. I have spiritual beliefs. I've got uh, vast spiritual beliefs. And I haven't discussed them because discussing spiritual beliefs is a perspective. And no matter what perspective I take on it, everyone else is going to have their own. And I will share different perspectives with people, as I have done here with my Aboriginal heritage. It's one of the reasons, because my dad couldn't find out, that when I was in northern New South Wales, I sought out the Aboriginals there, tried to find out from them what I couldn't find out in Tasmania, to try and find common elements of, you know, look, I see how Aboriginals are projected. I see them, you know, in the cities. I see them, yeah, some of the things like so many see that they don't like. But, you know, it's not just Aboriginals who do it. It's lots of them, lots of different coloured people do it. It's not a matter of being racist when you say that certain things occur. It's like you can't say anything against a, a, an Aboriginal because it's racist. It's like, oh, fuck off, it's racist. You've been a dick of a human being. You've been a dick of a human being. You know, being an Aboriginal does not give you an excuse to be whatever you want to be. And if anyone pulls you up on it, you go, oh, you're racist. You can't say that. Oh, piss off. Of course I can. I'll call a spade a spade. And I don't care what colour you are. If you're out there falsely representing something, I'll also say that too. And yeah, that is only by my opinion. If you don't like that, tough. You know what you do with that? You push the stop button and you go to a different channel. <laughs> it's that easy. So when I get people that do actually come and leave me comments and want to try and say, oh, well, you got it all wrong, you need to look at it this way. Well, first of all, I'm not going to... Um, if you want to say something, say it. Say what you want me to look at differently. Like, say, for example, I got my explanation of something wrong. You write a comment, you put in how you see it, how you explain it, and say, well, I don't see it the same way as you. You don't come at me and say, you're wrong, and leave it at that. It's like, oh, you know, I, I could toy with you a little bit. You obviously haven't seen in my previous videos <laughs> all my comments. I'm a random child, you know. That's how come I can do these videos, where most others won't. 
because I'm a random child and I'm going to say things that other people won't. I'm going to say things that plenty won't like too. Guess what? That's been my whole life. I've got a good sense of who I am. And, you know, if you think I'm wrong, well, fine. That's cool. You can think I'm wrong. But if you want to come and try and tell me I'm wrong because you've got it all figured out and you're right and now I should correct myself, well, you're not going to get, you know, you're not going to get a really good me. <laughs> I was gonna say you haven't haven't watched a lot of my other videos, have you? Now I don't take offence, but what I say, well, I probably will give offence because I'm not going to come. Uh, I'm not going to take all this bullshit. Like, do you know how much stuff you see on Facebook where someone brings up a subject? And someone turns around and says, oh, you've got no right to say that because. And then they argue about the because. They, they, they completely forget about the whole topic in the first place. Because they're all arguing over about who's right. No, I'm in a better position to say this because my tribe's here, from here. And I'm connected this way. And I know this because. And the other one comes back and says, no, no, no. It's this way because, and I'm only trying to do this, and you're not looking at it this way. Oh, I mean, you look at all these back and back and forth conversations, and it's like, seriously, you people, all you're doing is arguing and justifying yourself, your opinion to each other. You actually haven't had an opinion to actually justify it over. You know what I mean? The whole thing that it started over isn't even being talked about. You're talking about who's right and who's wrong and how you should... The right person, you know, is telling the wrong person how they should change it, but not even say how. But I'm right because I'm connected to the tribes and the bloodline through this and I've got the power because of this. Well, guess what? You have got no more power in the tribes or over me or anybody else than we each have over ourselves. Now on this planet, you can come from whatever tribe you want. I don't care. But, you know, you can't use it as an excuse to be a dick to other people. And that's all I see about all these tribal issues that are getting argued over with the OSTF. Everybody's arguing over, you know, my opinion's right because I'm more valid because I'm connected here, I know this and I know that and you have to see it from my perspective. Then they'll turn around and say, yeah, but I'm this and I'm that and no, you have to see it from my perspective. And it's like, can you not agree that you both have different perspectives? Now, what was the original question that somebody asked and is anyone going to talk about that? And it's this kind of going around in circles about justifying, oh, you know, I'm a bigger victim than you because, you know, we know of more tragedies that happened in our past, in our culture, than what happened over there. And we're more connected because, you know, they didn't dilute it and do this and that and other. I mean, everybody's arguing over who they're fucking related to. You're not doing anything in the now. And all you're arguing in, is doing is dividing everybody because you're trying to all prove yourselves right when it's your perspective. You're all right, okay? Nobody else is wrong. But if they see things differently to you, perhaps you can show them how they are seeing it differently. Explain it. <laughs> Explain how you see something differently. Don't just talk about, look, I've got a justification to say this because I represent this tribe and I've got the power and, you know what, quite frankly, I don't give a shit. Just get to the point. Say what it is that you've got to say and let others decide whether they're going to believe it or not, whether it's right or wrong or not. Uh, and, yeah, I will put my point of view forward and I will be, in a lot of cases, true to my convictions. And 
I will not change my mind on certain things because I've evolved so far. I'm not going to go backwards for crying out loud. You know, so rather than tell people that, you know, that they are small-minded and have a go at them, I will, yeah, I do get to be a bit of a smart ass. <laughs> I have, <laughs> sorry. Well, you know what? If there's one thing, especially my son has taught me, it doesn't matter how much you explain yourself to people when they ask you these questions, it's never going to be good enough and they're never going to hear what you said. You could spend a month of Sunday saying it and it's still not getting through because the thing is they don't want you to have an opinion, they want you to agree with them. So they'll just keep on at you until you agree with them. And that's not going to happen. Because I'm getting my education. I am learning and growing in other areas from what I consider to be very trusted and honourable sources and the least corrupted out of all the knowledge in Australia on the tribes. This is what I believe. So you're not going to get me to unbelieve it because you come and make a comment, you're wrong. Yeah, guess what? I'm wrong about a lot of things. But what I believe I'm, well, on the right track about, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong, but I will. Mm. I think you know what I'm talking about, Jeff, don't you? <laughs> anyway, I've been yakking on for ages now. Happy New Year to people. It's... um. 2021 and it's a whole new year there's been lots of new year resolutions made you know what I gave up making them because I decided why wait for once a year to make new resolutions when it was just as easy to turn around and go when you had learned something new and evolved and changed and grew in some direction that guess what I'm not going to wait for the new year to make a change I'm going to do it right now so I don't celebrate the new year as such in that respect and make all these New Year's resolutions because every time I learn and grow from something, there's a new resolution to write, I'm not going to do this. And I know it works because, you know, there are a lot of things that I used to beat my head against when I was, well, even five years ago. But every time I started to think of it in a certain way, I would stop myself and say, no, remember you cannot change that. Only focus on the things that can be changed. Because, you know, I've studied the past and the history of so many different cultures. But in the end, there's one truism that comes up. I'm never going to find out the truth. And it's not going to change a thing. Whatever the past is, it's gone. The only thing that can be changed is now. So it doesn't matter, you know, what happened to my grandmother. You know, if she was even uh, the victim. It doesn't matter because whatever happened, she's long gone. So is the past with her. The, but what I can change is what I do now. I can't even try and find out who my dad's real dad is. It's impossible for me to ever know and find out. So I accept that and I move on from that. And I also use that as part of why I have always been so honest and open with my kids. Before mum died, she used to say, why do you tell them things like that? You know, and it was only telling them the truth over, you know, a person that was doing the wrong thing. And I'd say they're doing the wrong thing. It's, see, in mum's day, if an adult was doing the wrong thing, you don't tell a kid that that adult was doing the wrong thing. That's disrespectful. It's like, no, no, mum. It doesn't matter if that adult is doing the wrong thing. You should actually tell your child and point out to the, your child that's doing the wrong thing. That's what it looks like. 
This is why the, the white culture is so fucked up, why it's so disjointed, why there are so many drug addicts and alcoholics and anemics and huh, so many flaky vegans who think they've found their way to, to God through starvation. Anyway, I said that was going to be it, and that is it. Happy New Year. I thought for the new year I'd share a little bit of, well, my unknown history. <laughs> my unknown history that will never, ever be known. I can't ever prove it. And you wait and see how many people will say, oh, go on, prove that you're Aboriginal. Go on, prove it. I don't need to prove it, okay? So anyone that does, <laughs> I dare you to leave a comment and ask me to prove it. Go on, I dare you to. <laughs> that will be fun, won't it? <laughs> I know, some think I'm a bit nasty and go over the top sometimes. But as I said, I'm a random child. Always have been, always will be. And maybe that's why this random child's going to achieve results in other things that have failed by doing things that ordinary and normal people supposedly do. Because I'm just going to be so random I might actually achieve something. <laughs> and on that note, Happy New Year and uh, I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.